Okay. How are you? Good coffee? Bad coffee? No coffee? Gee, bloody hell. Coffee is so important. It's the drug of choice. Okay, that was an amazing start today. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, we've got a great session now, but I just wanted to reflect on a couple of conversations I had at break, but also the whole idea of creativity. Uh, how many of you say you would say you're creative? Thank you. That's about 40%. The rest of you are lying. Okay, because all creativity is... All creativity is, is imagining a world that hasn't arrived yet. It's not drawing it, it's not singing about it, it's not playing it on a lute. It's just imagining it, and we can, we can all do that. And we're at that point where you really wouldn't imagine a worse world. You'd only imagine a better world, better politics, better sustainability. And, and I think it's, it's really interesting. I've been doing sustainability for 32 years now, before it was cool, and we've failed, abysmally. Because what we try to do is scare people into a changed behaviour rather than describe a world that is significantly richer, better and nicer to be in. That's, that's the best way. Give them a carrot, not a stick. And as designers, as creatives, your key skill is observation. And your job is not to ever to move pencil or pixel. Your job is to move hearts and minds. And, and remember that. It's not pencil or pixel. It's hearts and minds. Now, I'm so excited to introduce the next speaker, Wolfgang Butchers. We've just been talking about the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which we both have this huge fondness for. Um, and I'm going to just get out of the way and leave it to you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me. Can you hear me okay at the back? Is that okay? Brilliant, okay. Yes, my name's uh, Wolfgang uh, Butchers. Uh, uh, I'm an artist, uh, sculptor. Uh, and my studio is actually here in Nottingham. And I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about, uh, I suppose, why I do, why I do work. Uh, and kind of what's important, maybe, uh, as an artist. Uh, this is a, I'm going to talk about three or four pieces first and then talk about a sculpture which I'm doing actually in Taiwan, which is a work in progress, which I thought you might find interesting because it talks a bit about the process rather than just the, uh, the finished thing. This is a sculpture called The Hive, which is in a Kew Gardens. And the important thing about this, and I think all my work, is this idea about everything is connected. We're all stardust. Uh, we're living in uh, serious, challenging times with the environment. And I think even though in, in some ways we're, we've never been more connected, we've never been more disconnected uh, ever. Uh, and so with this piece, this, uh, there's a live, uh, uh, bee colony, which we send signals to the sort of sculpture, and whatever's happening with uh, inside the inside the uh, the bee colony gets expressed as light and sound. So the idea is to kind of create not just an object, but to create an experience, to create an atmosphere, but to to maybe change. I, I kind of believe if you can change maybe how people feel and get that open, maybe you can maybe sort of change how people uh, actually do things. These are, these are a series of work all about space. Uh, this is a, a sculpture in, uh, in Melbourne. It's about five metres uh, in, in diameter. And the idea here, it's uh, linked to the uh, solar panels on the, on the building of the roof. So whatever's happening uh, to the actual building is expressed as, as light on the, on the sculpture. And, and the idea is this, making this connection between the inside and the outside. A piece of mine in Chicago, this is uh, uh, the John Hancock Tower in Chicago. One of the interesting things about that building was it was the first uh, piece of architecture not to have any internal columns. So in their wisdom, the, the architects actually uh, split it in two. So the idea here was to kind of create a, a, uh, a map of the 15,000 brightest stars you can see from the with your naked eye above Chicago, but it's an illusion. It's actually a, a hemisphere. This is a mirrored sort of ceiling. And so it kind of creates this idea of a hemisphere. And in the pool below, there's a, a black granite pool. So again, it creates this, this sense of kind of connection and infinity. Uh, the 15,000 stars are actually uh, expressed as hand-blown glass balls, uh, which gently, uh, gently pulse. This piece, again, the same astrophysicist. And again, when I was a kid, I used to sort of think, 
that science and art were actually uh, polar opposites. And as I've kind of, I know, kind of got older, kind of come to realise that science and art are really, really sort of similar. We're all trying to maybe express what it means to be kind of human uh, in this world. This is a, a piece called Una, and again, it reflects the, the 17,000 brightest stars above sort of Canberra. Each star is uh, expressed a, as, a, as a perforation in this four metre diameter stainless steel sphere. And the idea, it connects uh, yourself to the piece by, by reflection, uh, uh, the landscape. Uh, and as you walk closer towards it, you look through one of these kind of perforations. And inside of it, there's another two metre diameter stainless steel sphere. And so this almost acts like a microcosm of the universe, this idea that uh, the stars are always there, but actually what you see uh, might not even exist anymore. So it's this idea of trying to create magic, this, this idea of trying to create a sense of uh, impermanence. And at night time, there's a, inside the sphere itself, there's a, a whole series of uh, fibre optics, the whole piece kind of gently sort of glows at night. So it's this idea of kind of, I suppose, sculpture not being permanent. It's always fluid, it's always kind of moving. This is a, a piece uh, closer to home called uh, Corona, uh, and it works with some uh, scientists from NASA. And the idea with this that we have these two uh, uh, satellites which are actually fixed on the sun in, uh, in real time, and they uh, express the energy on the, uh, uh, on the building. So whatever's happening on the surface of the sun is expressed as light on the sculpture. It makes a reference to Nottingham's lace history with the, the lace sort of patterns. And this is a piece... We got. OK, 10 minutes to go. OK. Uh, so this is uh, a piece which I'm currently working on, and it's called uh, Lumen. And it's uh, currently being installed in uh, Taichung, in, in Taiwan. And one of the interesting things about, and beautiful things about uh, uh, Taiwan, it's an amazing country, it's an amazing city. But because it's uh, uh, incredibly kind of built up, like now you can't see the stars because of, uh, because of light pollution. And also subsequently, since the big uh, nuclear disaster in Japan uh, a few years ago, they've actually started uh, putting back all the, the coal reactors rather than nuclear power. So it means that most nights you can never sort of see the stars. So I had this idea, how could you express the, uh, the stars uh, uh, with, uh, within, the, uh, within the site and, uh, and make a real connection to it? So what, what I did was triangulated the star map. So these are the, uh, I think, the 25,000 uh, brightest stars you can see above uh, Taichung. And they were uh, sort of triangulated. And because I've been using sound a lot in my sculptures uh, recently, and one of the, you know, the really interesting things about using sound that actually kind of, correct, kind of connects you to the moment, I think uh, you internalize it, it becomes part of you as you're actually, li actually listening to it. And so we developed these things called star boxes. And I don't know if you can remember or you can imagine, like in old Victorian times, you used to have those little things called pianolas, which you'd put like a little roll of uh, paper with little perforations, and you'd roll it, and they would kind of make a tune like on a piano. And so if you can imagine that each one of these, each one of the stars is a note, and then what we can do with a star box, uh, this piece, this here, is actually, is actually play the stars. Each one of the stars that you sort of see is assigned a, a note or a sort of texture. So it means uh, that we can play the stars in real time. And so this, uh, so at first, before I actually had the idea of how the sculpture could actually look, I thought it would be an interesting way to try and how could you actually establish uh, the form of the piece through, through sound. And so I uh, uh, worked with the, a few musicians I've been working with over the last few years who playing a band called uh, Spiritualized. And uh, worked out that the, uh, that the, the, the ground underneath uh, Taichung uh, hums in the key of C. So I worked with an uh, uh, amazing artist called Fu Rei and, uh, and uh, Zhong Chen, and we created this installation. And this is, a, this is an experience rather than a sculpture, it's a space. So the idea is that you walk through this uh, uh, 
uh, uh, this landscape of stars. And then the audience actually sort of sits in between as well as the musicians. It was always moving. Uh, and it was an improvised piece uh, by using the, the, the star boxes. Uh, Fure actually then responded to us. Everything always starts with an idea, so everything. And, uh, sorry, just moved into this other one. And, uh, and it's ended up being a, a sculpture called, uh, called Lumen. And so the idea was that we used uh, these star points and, uh, and, and the sounds developed within the, within the performance uh, to create this uh, to create the sculpture, which is about 11 meters in uh, diameter. Uh, and each one of these uh, prisms is, a, is an extrusion, which uh, each one of the points here is a, a one of the points of the light. And the idea is that you walk inside this, uh, this large dome and then through, uh, uh, through a, a live, uh, uh, data feed from the sun from from NASA, we get uh, uh, we get the uh, uh, the soundscape. So on the perimeter of the sculpture itself, we have a, it's this idea of of expressing time. On the outer ring, it's expressing uh, 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 the years. So this is the uh, the screenshot of the sort of sun. So is that whatever's happening in the sun in real time expresses the intensity of the piece. And you can sort of see the lighting travels around the sort of sculpture like over a year. So it's a, in a way, it's a, it's like a giant star map. It's like a giant sort of sundial. In the in the center, when you walk into the piece here, it's a, it's a, this this band of light uh, moves around every sort of 60 seconds. We all know what a clock look, kind of looks like, so I suppose it's a kind of clue to give us sort of sense that what we're dealing with is time. And then in the outer ring here, it's, it's every month. So, so it's this idea of, uh, uh, again, that we're all co connected, but it's the sound which is, uh, which is connecting us to the space. You can see here now the, the light itself, it kind of pulls around, it pushes around. And the idea that you're in, uh, in inspired the space, connected to the earth, connected to, uh, uh, connected to, uh, to Tai Chung itself. Uh, this is the factory over in uh, South uh, Nottingham where we sort of built it. You can kind of get a sense of the sort of scale of it. Uh, this is the outer ring, and then these are all the prisms uh, which, which we're walking through. There's about eight containers of, uh, uh, of the, which went from Nottingham to Taiwan, one about me sort of three weeks ago, and it arrived on site uh, maybe about sort of two weeks ago. And so, so the idea, you have this, this idea trying to create this experience, trying to create this, uh, this sense of kind of wonder, but then there's the, the practical way of how you actually kind of realize this, uh, this piece I've been working on for probably uh, I don't know, seven or eight years, and it's finally happened. And then even with all the, the best will in the world, we sent all the, the drawings, the engineering drawings over about two years ago, and we finally got the, the photographs from site about three weeks ago, two weeks ago, and uh, they're all wrong. All the connections, all the details are all in complete, <laughs> completely the wrong place. And so we had a team of 14 people all about to, about to go out. And uh, <laughs> so it was a kind of logistical nightmare how you kind of sort of sort that out really, really quickly uh, with a different language. And so some photographs here, which sort of show basically we had to rip everything out, re-channel it redesign it, the engineer to kind of completely sort of redevelop the, the, the whole thing. And then three days ago, uh, the, they finished doing the, uh, 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 the foundations. At nine o'clock in the morning, uh, the team had done their health and safety talk and actually sort of started work at half nine. So we kind of just got there through that. So we'll be there for about another three or four weeks in the installation. This is then put in the... Uh, uh, the kind of exo sort of skeleton uh, on sort of site, and then all the prisms kind of go through this. So, the, and, and the idea that when the uh, the prisms, when the star actually kind of hit the ground, there's this sort of sense of magic. You don't sort of see the plinth. So this is the idea that it's a very elegant, sort of gentle kind of dish. So you walk into this sort of space. And I suppose in terms of the soundscape, what you're starting to hear changes over over the years. We've actually written a. Uh, a soundtrack which lasts for 365 days and it changes uh, over 24 hours as well. And the idea, I suppose, using the idea of that the stars that you see, 
you probably can't, some of them don't even exist anymore. So it's this idea again of using kind of reverb and echo. So in the daytime, what the soundscape does, we push more and more uh, reverb onto the onto all the sort of sounds and there because kind of reverb and echo, it's almost like, it's like a memory and a trace uh, uh, of a sound of an object. And so the idea that it's always moving, always sort of changing. So when the audience, a visitor walks through, through the sort of piece, there's always connection to, to the site, to the time, and it's always different. This was about three days ago. It's actually kind of built a lot bigger now. It's about, I think it's about four more pieces to go. And hopefully in about four weeks, five weeks sort of time, this will look something like this. You walk into the piece. These are the sort of stars, which are all be sort of glowing and pulsing and finish like this. And again, I suppose it's the, the idea that that we're all connected, that we're all sort of stardust. And even though it's really important that to kind of sort of live in the now, that uh, we'll all kind of go back to dust and because uh, that's where we come from. Thank you very much. See you. That was amazing, truly. There's lots to think about there. At some point, art and science were the same thing, and then someone pulled them apart and put them in opposition to one another. And what I love about what you do is you're pulling them back together again and making the tangible, the intangible tangible. I love it. Um, my wedding song, our wedding song, was spiritualized, actually. I bet you like Spaceman 3 as well, didn't you, before that? Yeah, yeah, he's ahead. Um, okay, so um, next up, that was, a, that was absolutely incredible. And uh, Next up, I'm going to make way for, um, and give a hand for, Penny Powser, who is the cre queen of green. And I've seen a little bit of what Penny does, and I'm so excited to hear more about it. And look at that jacket. Oh, he's a very naughty boy. Love him. Um, well, I'm, I'm so struck with imposter syndrome now, uh, attempting to take the stage after the amazing uh, Wolfgang. Absolutely incredible. So, um, where's my clickery thing? Oh, there we are. Have I got a clickery thing? Have I got one? Yeah, there was one. There you go. Oh, I'll have a clickery thing. Now, me and presentations and, you know, working microphone and... Oh, hello. We got one. Oh, we'll get there. La la la. Do a little dance. Make a little dance. So that said James Brown there, couldn't it? Could be. We'll get there. I could just talk. You can do that. Kathy's lovely. We'll be hearing Kathy later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's here. Sorry, people. Talk amongst yourselves. So, anyway. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Penny was supposed to go first, so oh, apologies. Is that the clip? Oh, there we go. There, there we, we go. Oh, there look, we got is. one. Penny was actually supposed to go before Wolfgang, so apologies for that. Uh, oh, Penny, so sorry. That's all right, don't worry. <laughs> I was going to say I was really nervous. I feel much more relaxed now. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> So, hello, lovely Nottinghams. Are you all right? Yay! It's been a week. We all need a bloody big cuddle. So here's one. <laughs> Catch it, right? So I love, I absolutely love this quote, right? And it's that thing, you know, when we, and particularly in a week like we're, we're having at the moment, just that small act of reaching out and saying, you're all right, giving a bit, little, little bit of cuddle, you just never know where that's going to lead. And uh, this idea that when we plant a seed, you know, we plant it in the earth, and you can hear me talking a lot about seeds, so apologies beforehand, we, ca we can't see what's going on. But underneath the surface of whether it's a physical seed or if it's an idea that's kind of just planted itself in the brain, it can take years for that to germinate, years and years. But sometimes we just need to do the best that we can and kind of trust in the process. And believe me, when you plant that seed, sometimes you have absolutely no idea how far that idea is going to go. So urban abundance is one of my absolute favourite phrases. 
and uh, I'm going to be mostly talking to you about how in Nottingham we've been creating edible spaces in urban places. I do like alliteration, one seed at a time. And, uh, but first of all, I'm going to start you off with a little bit of my origin story. And lovely Bluebell Wood. We all love a Bluebell Wood. And I grew up in Suffolk, lovely, idyllic, beautiful. And um, I learnt to forage from a really early age and learnt to garden with my mum. And it all sounds rather lovely. But unfortunately, my poor old dad was mentally very ill. And it meant that often he was violent, physically, emotionally and sexually. And I needed a way out. So I would jump on my little blue bike and on this one particular day after a particularly horrible episode, I just needed to get the hell out and go to my favourite wood, which is about five minutes down the road. And luckily for me, it looked like this. It was in full bloom. That Jimi Hendrix psychedelic purple haze was there for me that day. And I just laid down very carefully amongst these flowers, inhaling the perfume, looking up at the can canopy of trees, and for the first time in I don't know how long I could remember, I felt safe. I felt safe, I felt secure, I felt nurtured, and I felt unconditional love. And in that moment, and I was seven and a half, eight, I was very young, I suddenly realized that Mother Earth was my third parent. And I entered a contract with Mother Earth at that point to love and nurture her as much as she loved and nurtured me. So, fast forward to 1979, I followed a boy to Nottingham. I wasn't stalking him, okay. I did follow him to Nottingham and uh, kind of got my first job. That relation fizz relationship fizzled out, but I did fall in love with Nottingham, so I've stayed here ever since. Now, my first job was at the Nottingham Evening Post and uh, I met a man, married him. Very bad idea, <laughs> uh, really bad idea. Um, Turned out he was a stalker, but that's another story during the coffee break, right? Um, but the one thing that we were compatible about was we were absolutely, and this is what kept us together for years, was that we loved to grow food. We were organic gardeners, and we wanted to teach other people. So in 1989, I think it was, bloody long time ago, we set up Nottingham Organic Gardens, NOGS. And NOGS is still going. This is the beautiful allotment. It has over 100 members. Nottingham Organic Gardeners Potato Day is a big event in the Nottingham <laughs> calendar. No, seriously, there's hundreds of them all wanting the potatoes. It's fabulous. So this has been something absolutely marvellous. And to go back to the seed analogy, this seed that I planted with him, although our relationship ended up on the compost heap of life, um, this has grown to the most beautiful tree that continues to fruit and inform, and it's just absolutely lovely. Very, very, very proud Nottingham Organic Gardeners. So in Nottingham, we are absolutely blessed by having the most beautiful network of gardens, community gardens, and some of you may have seen them. We also have an incredible network of social eating spaces, about 25 of each, roughly, which are growing all the time. Because here in Nottingham like so many other places in the country. But here in Nottingham, where we actually have the lowest disposable income in the country, we're officially the poorest. And over a third of households and one in three students, and I hope you're not experiencing this, but some of you may be, are not always able to access good food because we know that bad food is cheaper. So um, I've always been really fixated on growing, as you can probably tell. And... Um, uh, kind of fast forwarding, I was, I was able to get into what I'm doing now, but we'll catch up with that in a minute. So this, this is my eco home and a few people in this room have been in this house and me and my husband bought um, this house back in 19, when was it, 98. It had been a student house, so it was shit. <laughs> um, uh, the only insulation was mould and polystyrene tiles. It wasn't good, but it meant we could bash it about because we got this crazy idea. We wanted to see if we could turn a freezing cold in winter, boiling hot house in summer, into an eco home. Nobody had ever done it before. Everybody said we were mad, but we had this dream and we planted that seed. And our aim was to see how far we could gain autonomy in food, water and energy in an existing house on a small plot. 
and we did that in 1998. And a really, really key part of this house is the front garden. It's tiny, but it's absolutely stuffed with food. And this tree that you see at the front, the plum tree, is really famous locally. So we're known locally as the plum house. And when it's ready to harvest, I put my battered sign out the front that says, get your gums around my plums. <laughs> and, they, and they do, they actually do. And um, so many connotations, so little time. Um, <laughs> But uh, so this, this has become such a thing. And uh, last year, when there was a, a festival, um, I had a little knock on the door because the plums were in their full luminescence. And this lady said, would you mind very much if I picked a plum? I said, no, absolutely, sign there, go ahead. So we were chatting. Uh, she was from the Czech Republic. I said, oh, God, you know you're foraging the Czech Republic, chatting about that. And then this Chinese family come along. They're looking at the plums. And I said, would you like some? I said, oh, oh yes. Plums. He said, yeah, eat them. So they're eating the plums, and we're all chatting. And then uh, this group of uh, eight Asian lads comes along, two of whom I know, because every year they get plums for Grandma, and Grandma lives around the corner from me, and she makes chutney jam, she gives it to me, so it's all good. But six of them were going, well, what, what's them, what's them, what's them things? He said, they're called plums. <laughs> and you can eat them, so what? Don't have to wash them or nothing. I said, no, it's absolutely fine. So they were eating it. So we had 16 people in the front garden all just going, mm, like that. So this is just a lovely example of how this simple act of just sharing the produce of a tree we have has led to international conversations and the power of, mm, not on, but mm. And, uh, and, and it really struck me, this idea, the very simple idea of urban abundance and what happens when you share food in public spaces. So my tiny, tiny front garden, look at this. Look at this little, beautiful space. And from this tiny plot, we harvest something every single day of the year. In fact, I did a piece on Radio 4 a few years ago where we were talking about food miles and Christmas dinners, because I do stuff like that. And uh, I said, we're, we're currently eating 13 different types of salad leaf that I've harvested this morning. It's a tradition at home that we always have a salad on Christmas Day because, you know, salad. And, uh, you know, it was just like, it's really, really tiny. But this has stimulated so many conversations and four people on our road now, you know, grow edible shit in their front garden too. Lovely. So I'd now like to talk to you about food share. So... Very weirdly, um, living in the eco house and working on a project, I got selected to become a TV presenter. No intention ever of being on the TV. In fact, my mum said, don't do it, dear. You know what they'll say. You're fat. I said, yes, 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 I know that, mum, but I'm going to do it anyway. And it was the first time that the BBC, it was BBC Two, um, wanted to put on a show about household sustainability, which was kind of my day job. So I ended up doing this series, eight episodes, went really well, funnily enough, three million viewers a week, sold to 27 countries, and I got a book deal. Hurrah! <laughs> but after all of that, um, my mum had a stroke. So it meant that I went from, you know, kind of doing stargazy stuff, being on Loose Women, Celebrity Weakest Link. Uh, you'd be glad to know Piers Morgan went out before me. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, but it brought opportunities where people said, oh, you're well known, will you be patron of something? So I was asked to become patron of this wonderful charity called Food Share, which set up educational food growing spaces in schools that were a bit like fresh food banks. And at the same time, we taught kids climate friendly ways of growing. Now, as a patron, I love this so much and I did not want to be just like a figurehead. I wanted to do it. So we set one up in my youngest kids school, Ed Walton Primary, which has a farm and beehives and everything, normal primary school, and we set this up. And it had the most extraordinary impact. So then after this, I thought, well, let's set up others. So we, we did some in other primary schools. And then I was doing a thing at uh, an NTU presentation thing. And they said, do you want you know, have a chat? I said, I want to talk about food share. And straight after that, about eight heads of department came up and said, we want food share too. I said, yeah, but it's for kids. I said, no, we want food share. So now at the Clifton campus, and some of you NTU students will know this, we set up the food share garden. And I'm delighted to say that not only has it been a wonderful space for students from different countries who grew up with their hands in the soil and then came here and had no access to getting their hands in the soil, that's been wonderful. But additionally, the food has been shared. 
So with Ed Walton Primary School, the produce is shared with an amazing place called the Friary Drop-In Centre, which is a centre for homeless people. And every week, the produce is taken by the kids and a teacher and dropped off. And it's all excellent produce. And we calculate everything that comes off the garden. So we, we actually know what we're growing and what the value is. And at NTU, I'm delighted to say that the Food Share Garden has also been incorporated into a number of academic courses. And it has also contributed to its incredible sustainability status. So I'm really glad the Food Share Garden had a part to play in that. All from tiny seeds, people. Seeds. So here we are. Look at it. I could live in that polytunnel. I just <laughs> love that polytunnel. Um, and uh, it, it, it's just an absolutely wonderful space. Now, in July, there'll be absolutely loads of black currants, millions of them, so go and pick them. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, uh, this lovely bunch of people um, are a group that I meet every Wednesday down by the canal in Nottingham. And after a chance encounter, and so much stuff happens as a result of chance encounters with quite a senior bloke who's a friend of mine at Canals and Rivers Trust, I'm a forager. So I said, oh, I'd love to lead a little foraging thing along the Trent. So we did like a sample thing. We had, I think, 20 people turn up, but it was massively oversubscribed. and It went well. And as a result of that, we decided that I would lead a course. And it was part of social prescribing. Uh, Nottingham's one of five cities in the country that are kind of testing social prescribing. And this is part of the Canals and Rivers Trust wellbeing course. Absolutely brilliant it is too. And the lady right on the end, Carol, when we met each other, I thought, we know each other. We'd met 30 years ago. It was great. The number 30 comes up a lot in these talks. It's like everything's 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we meet and not only do we learn to forage, we also plant additional forage. So we're putting in things like apple trees. We're putting in all sorts of stuff. But we are also putting in raised beds. <coughs> So, one of the things that struck me about the lovely gardens we have, the community garden, gardens, allotments, and all the really groovy stuff is, they're not actually completely accessible to the public. Now, as part of my life, being a gardening, a gardener and a forager, I also have a strategic role, and I'm chair of something called Notting Good Food Partnership, which is a, a loose coalition of organisations, academia, local business community, um, and... Uh, and the idea is that we all want to push towards a more sustainable, more equitable local food system. And we're part of a national network of sustainable food places, which is just phenomenal. The government needs to listen more. So I thought, we need to be growing more stuff in public spaces. And this idea was just totally clenched for me when one day I was walking down to a meeting and this homeless guy just falls in step with me, we're chatting, called Alex. And he said... Um, you're right. I said, I'm all right. So we were chatting about how we couldn't access fresh food. And I said, what if you were able to, without question, just be able to go and harvest stuff, harvest an apple, harvest some fruit, harvest a bit of salad, no permission needed, no one's going to question you, would that make a difference? And he said, well, it would give me some dignity, wouldn't it? It would give me some dignity, not having to ask permission, not having to beg for food. So that's what we did. And then just very, very quickly... Uh, another organisation arising out of the amazing green hustle that you're going to be hearing about soon with uh, Adam Pickering have done more work along the canal. This is some of the lovely volunteers that then have been involved with the wonderful garden at Nottingham College that Steve and John Morgan were talking about that I've been so happy to be part of. Um, I garden there. We've now got another gar other gardener to take over, but it's such a magical space. Look at it. It's beautiful. And then this is another garden I set up just recently at a local church called the No Boundaries Garden. This is another fresh food bank. Uh, the food is currently going into their social cafe. Here's the lovely produce. Another project I've just heard about, nothing to do with me, is putting on by a local food bank. And they're growing uh, food in public spaces. And I heard just recently, and this will be my kind of closing thing, that, um, again, after a happen chance conversation about the Not Nottingham uh, Parklet, which has been put together by all amazing partners in the city, I said, why don't you do an edible campus? And we've just heard that they've got funding not only to create edible campuses on both their new campuses, but they're also going to employ someone. So that little seed that came about all that time ago has now gone from being you know, quite small-scale projects into all of a sudden a big organisation with enormous green space saying, hey... We need to do this too. 
So never forget that when you're planting a seed, and this is my takeaway action for you, let it nurture under the soil, let it grow, and when, it, when it's ready to bloom, it will. And whatever that harvest is, please share it. Thank you. You know, when you meet someone and you think, I'm going to be friends with them forever, that's how I feel about Penny. I, I, that was amazing. And you've stolen my, my, my link, which was you don't just plant physical, biological seeds. You plant seeds of hope and love, and, and they come up 30 years later. It's always 30 years. It's really, really interesting. And I was involved in Incredible Edible. A long, long Pam Warhurst is a really dear friend of mine. And, and, and the, you, you're taking that to an entirely new level. So this is actually like a living funeral. You're incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to get, uh, we've got, it's not Kathy next. We've got John next on the agenda. Or are we changing it? But she's not next on the agenda. Oh, Chrissy, what am I doing? Kathy. Kathy. Okay, Kathy, over to you. How are you? Brilliant to be here. I think I see some friends in the audience, which is great. Hello. And lots of new faces that may never have heard of uh, Challenge Nottingham, which is what I manage in the city. So I'm really excited to share with you today all the things that we do and the ways that you can get involved. Um, right, click that. So um, Challenge is a citywide partnership. And um, just, I love looking at these pictures. These photos were taken at the Summer Family Arts and Parent Power Academy that we ran last year. Um, and it was, a, it was a project basically that gave free bus travel to a number of families, 30 families, and they were given an itinerary over the summer holidays to visit five different arts venues that they'd never been to before. And the idea of it was that they became champions and would tell us, give us really honest feedback about what their experience had been like and how it could be made better for other children. And I'm dead excited because this summer we're doing something similar and it's getting bigger and better. So there's going to be lots of free activity throughout August for children and families. Um, but essentially what we're doing is advocating for a broad, adventurous and creative cultural education for every child growing up here. And um, broad because, essentially, we want to encompass all art forms um, and we see that creativity is relevant for all disciplines and across the curriculum. Adventurous because um, it's all about discovering new things, going to new places, doing things differently. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, and, yet, and creative because... It's your creativity that gives you um, the courage, I think, to try something new, to have your voice heard. And, um, and that's just so important for all of us to embrace our creativity. And it's when you're a child that you're given that opportunity um, and you can really be, it can really be nurtured. Um, every child, I think, has the right to have their creativity nurtured, and I'm sure you'd agree. Um, and I certainly feel really honoured to be working with some incredible partners around the city to find ways to make that vision a reality. So where did it all begin? Back in 2015, the Arts Council um, created a call for action that was the Creative um, Education Challenge. And essentially that was all about making sure that local places, the arts venues, the theatres, the galleries, the, um, all of the institutions, the museums, were working better together for a more joined up approach to share resources, to have a more coherent and visible delivery of cultural education, so that the experiences for children and teachers it didn't rely on teachers having to, um, like, it didn't rely on one individual teacher doing all the research, but that we could together as a city make that really visible and relevant to all the schools. Um, 
So within, within Nottingham, you might recognise some of these organisations. We're so incredibly diverse and vibrant and have so many arts organisations that work together and are all committed to the vision. Um, and I think all of these partners, we do, we do things basically to, to, <laughs> in order to collaborate more effectively. That's the key to what we're trying to do. Our vision and our mission are essentially to ensure that every child is imaginative and innovative and creative. And what we really want is that the partnerships that we're developing, whether that's with housing associations, health, environment organisations, um, that the things that we're developing and the projects that we're doing are drawn out of the needs and interests of children and young people. So we want to be challenging ourselves as arts organisations and, and others to really think about children and what's going on for them in their lives. Um, yeah. So we do that. So Challenge does that by facilitating um, the collaborations. I'm a connector. I'm somebody that kind of tries to find out about what's going on everywhere <laughs> so that I can link people up and that everything can become more relevant and inspiring and accessible for everybody. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to just talk about the three main areas of work that we do, if you think of it in terms of the work we do with communities and the work we do with schools and the importance of our community of practice. We regularly work with a range of community partners. Um, so you'll see here a picture of the Bullwell Boat Race, which is coming up again in July, which is a fabulous event. You're all invited, but you have to bring a boat that you've made from recycled margarine tubs and things. Um, I'm dead proud to have been involved in Bullwell Arts Festival. It's the 10th year this year, and it's something that, um, along with other arts festivals, like the Bilber Arts Festival and Sherwood Art Week and Woolerton, really give an opportunity for people to celebrate local creativity. Um, and it makes such a difference for children um, to have that regularity, to, to know that every year in that, in that week there's going to be a focus for them on what they're doing. The excitement and the joy <laughs> and the fierce competition at this boat race in Bulwell was quite something to witness, wasn't it, <laughs> Rick? <laughs> and I think the thing for me um, about this is that it's about building your childhood memories. And just before I came out, I ripped off a photo, which I probably should have shared with you, um, or put on the slides. But I took, down, I took down a photo that's next to my computer. And it's of me in about 1986. So I'm about 10, and I'm with a friend. I, I, the memory of this is that I was... Um, we were in town on our own. Somehow, I think my parents had like let me loose with my friend. And there were people, I don't know who or why, but they put a paintbrush in my hand and they asked us to um, paint a huge, massive chicken. <laughs> and then they put it on a huge, massive scaffold in front of Birmingham Central Library. And you'll see, uh, you find me later if you want to see the picture. But I don't think I've ever been so happy. <laughs> <laughs> the thought of the kind of free, the sense of freedom that that gave me and safety in the fact that it was like something that we could do in town that, and we were creating something and it was our choice, how it looked, um, was just incredible at the time. And I think it's kind of driven me all through my life to try and develop those kinds of experiences for other people. Um, and I think that's what we're able to do. We're able to provide the frameworks and give people the tools to be able to do the things that they really um, can explore. So all of these arts, all of these community organisations work with challenge in different ways and we've developed really positive community relationships, um, partly through giving out thousands and thousands of art packs since the beginning of COVID, um, when it became obvious that we were there was such a disparity in access to arts materials. Um, and we've been able to keep that going since May 2020. At three times a year, we give out another load of um, materials to food banks and community organisations to distribute. Um, and this is just, uh, just to say that 
I think the thing that's become most valuable to people as being part of Challenge is the networking and sharing, the opportunity to um, come up with ideas and make them happen because we're doing them together. And that's what I obviously like about it too. So the stuff that we're doing with schools, the cultural rucksack is the name that we give to the collaborative work that we're doing with schools. It's very much about developing teachers' confidence and ability to use more creativity in the classroom and, um, and arts organisations not just coming up with an offer uh, that schools could take or leave it if they like, but to really think about how that could be embedded more within the curriculum, become something that teachers can rely on year in, year out. You'd be amazed. That massive long list of partners and arts organisations, I'm always amazed that people haven't been to those places, but I, that's just because I know them, and you know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. So I think it's really important that while children are in school, they're getting these chances to go places and do things. And it's often the... the um, it's, it's so important that it happens while you're in school. And that role of school to be able to introduce new things to kids is so important. These are the underpinning principles of the cultural rucksack that were developed in 2020 and uh, by Professor Chris Hall at the University of Nottingham. And the Education Improvement Partnership gave us the green light to shape the cultural rucksack. And we're dead excited that the Arts Council has given us two more years of funding to work with a cohort of primaries um, over the next two years to really deliver it um, in, in, in a way in which we really think about out-of-school visits as well as the stuff that will be going on in the classrooms. Uh, I'm sharing this slide just for those of you that are in Nottingham and that don't know about Challenge, just to give you a sense of all the different things that we do. So for teachers, we um, have culture meets every term that are recorded. You can watch them again online. We have bi-monthly newsletters for um, primary school teachers, secondary school teachers and parents and carers. Um, we obviously have the website, which is like a hub of information. If you're ever wanting to con connect with schools and make things happen, be on that website. It's a place to be. And we put, put together a really old-fashioned A1 wall planner for staff <laughs> classrooms, and I, which I kind of love that it's very old-fashioned. Um, because, you know, you've got to hold on to some things, haven't you? I think the work um, that's going on in Nottingham, some of it's obviously really inspiring and I haven't got enough time to share all of it but a lot of organizations now work in a much more in-depth long-term way with schools um, and you know have four or five year relationships that they're really sort of bedding in um, and one of those or one of those projects that uh, Rick and I are involved in is creativity collaboratives and I just wanted to share a little bit more about creativity collaboratives because it's um, it, it's all come out. Th th it's been um, what's the word initiated following a 2019 report by the Durham Commission into Creativity and in Education, which is worth looking up. Um, and it's all about teaching for creativity. So these five habits of learning, I think, are the things that we can all um, embrace and recognise are really important when we're learning anything. The five habits of learning are basically the, the things that we have to do when we're being creative. And so I just wish we could like ban anyone saying I'm not creative because it's all of these things that you recognize when you start to learn anything new and you can kind of use them as a bit of a lever. A, a, um, you can use them as something that you can gauge your confidence in different aspects of anything that you're trying to do for the first time. Um, and it's a really useful tool for, for children and, and, and teachers to use, and arts professionals are working with schools. So um, look, look them up if you're interested in, the, in teaching for creativity as a really useful framework. We have this overarching research question. Uh, how do we nurture our children's innate creative capacity and sustain their curiosity about the world? Um, 
And that's what we've been doing over the last two years. We've been looking at, with art creative practitioners have been working in schools, on residencies. We're about to go into the third year where there are 30-week um, projects taking place in 12 schools across the city. And we're part of a network of creativity collaboratives. There are eight of them around the country. So it's brilliant that Nottingham has got this opportunity and that we're leading the way in this work, which is really trying to finally um, push uh, England and the education system into catching up with the rest of the world, really, in terms of where we value creativity in, in our learning. Um, Citywide collaborative projects. Just this, this is just a few, but I just wanted to mention, in case you hadn't heard of them, um, that we are aiming to become a child-friendly city, and there's all kinds of things that you can get involved in to do with that. We um, have an incredible festival of science and curiosity every February. Um, we have the Young Creative Awards, which are just a fabulous way of recognising young talent. Nottingham Stories is a new project that recognises the fact that we're about to have a new central library and we want to celebrate storytelling and anyone can get involved and use the logo and put on a storytelling event this year. And RSC Day is coming up, it's always the last Thursday in June and it's always, we always do something that's around um, healthy relationships and this year the theme is kindness and we're making a massive collaborative kindness quilt with lots of schools with lots of kindness stories and QR codes built in that people can wrap themselves in. And it's going on tour to libraries. Um, connecting knots. So for, the, for those that are in Nottingham, and live in Nottingham and are students, please look at the Connecting Knots website and get involved in Connecting Knots. Follow Connecting Knots on Instagram. It's the Youth Cultural Partnership. So essentially we have a strategic cultural partnership and the young people, 16 to 24 year olds, that are from lots of different arts organisations come together once a month and they have an event budget and can put things on for other young people. And it's all about making things more accessible. Um, we're looking forward to this. So get involved in this, volunteer for it, wear the t-shirt if you can. <laughs> and if you want to um, be a part of Challenge and you sign up to this and you believe in it too, then just contact me uh, at that email address. And I need to mention that it's fabulous to be hosted by NTU. So thanks for that, NTU. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Uh, I, I, the whole idea of curbing creativity and curiosity in kids is utterly terrifying. So I'm really glad that you're doing this work. And a good friend of mine, I'm going to scroll through. Do you know where the, the, which order we're in? Do you know? There. There you go. Um, the whole idea of, um, of leaving that curiosity in your childhood, it's, you know, it's the key to all kinds of business growth for certain, as is kindness. And a good friend of mine's got a quote, um, a guy called James Victore. He said, the thing that made you weird as a kid makes you brilliant today. And, and I think we try, and, we try and iron that out of us when we, when we go into work. And it's really important that we don't iron it out. We spike it up. OK, uh, John Brown should have been here today, but he can't be here today. So we have a video. And I think if I just press forward, it'll play. And then I'll come up at the end and send you all off to lunch. So thank you very much, everybody. My name's John Brown. I'm the founder of Don't Cry Wolf. Um, we're a creative activism agency based uh, in London and Cornwall. And what I was going to talk about today was around how to be a creative comms activist, because I passionately believe in the idea that you as individuals, as creatives, as communicators, as sort of spiritual guides for fuddy-duddy, white, male, middle-class dominated business, um, could help to actually change the world and do some real, real good from the inside out of organisations. I fundamentally believe that organisations are a, a key element of fixing the shit show that we currently have um, in the world. I don't, I'm not a, I don't sort of buy into this idea that sort of all brands and businesses must go and we must completely reset. I think we can work with organisations, businesses and brands to usher in a more 
kind, distributive, regenerative um, economy. And if we can inspire and create these magnificent individuals to go out into the world of business and make real change and advocate for change and be an activist in their own right in their day-to-day -day work, um, then I think we can usher in that um, that difference that we're that we're all hope hopeful for. So we're going to go through different steps. Before that, it's important to kind of define what this sort of creative commons activism is. And what do I mean by that? And I think it's using the resources, talent, and platform of a brand to address a societal issue. So when you're working with an organisation or within an agency or within a sort of business structure, how do you use what they've got to address a societal issue? And and this is kind of my first port of call really because um yeah organizations are actually created to um do really one thing right now like legally and that's to earn money for a small number of people um and i think that's a bit wrong it's called the articles of association the articles of association of an organization says that that uh uh the the duty of that business is to um provide shareholder return but, you know, a, a, a well-placed, well-structured brand has the opportunity, the resource, the talent, the platform, the voice to do more than just earn cash for its shareholders. It could potentially help to bring about um, a bit of change. And there's examples of this in the world, right? There's some astonishing examples of this in, in, in the world. We all know and we all kind of massively jerk off to the idea of uh, of us all becoming Patagonia one day and... And, and and sort of you know get like living in a treehouse and sort of, uh, you know having a, a this this magnificent kind of um, uh, altruistic uh, uh, outlook on life whilst creating really really sexy fucking clothes and then handing over our business to sort of millions of children somewhere. Um, but you don't have to be Patagonia, right? You can be an organisation that has established a, has a well-established footprint, a well-established kind of set of resources, a great talent structure and still influence change and still do some really solid um, good in the world. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of campaigns of late that recently that I've seen that, you know, that have addressed anything from female healthcare into representation of uh, black people in the beauty industry. You know, there's, there's different ways in which you can kind of uh, address societal change through a brand and, and 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 through a business. So, you know, this is what that I see is sort of like creative comms activism. It's comms people, creative people dotted about in different parts of the world, in different organisations, trying to encourage that organisation to use its resources, talent and its platform um, to address a societal issue. So if that's the definition, how do we go about doing things like that? First and foremost, we need to know what the fuck we're activisming, man. Like this is this is one thing that really gets my goat, and sort of it sort of gets me a bit kind of hot under the collar. Well, there's lots of things that piss me off actually on a daily basis, but this is this is one of them. Um, and this is this idea of this understanding that um, somehow we're we're going to do everything all at once, right? And actually, it's really really important to be quite specific as to what we want to change first. And why we want to change it. Right. So let me give you an example, a fairly current example, actually. We're in Pride Month right now. And every fucking brand out there will be making sure that they've got a rainbow on their Instagram. Some might be investing in a Pride float, which is lovely, which is good. It's not a bad thing, by the way. I'm not saying these are bad things, but I think out of context or out of clarity as to what they're actually going to do, I think it become, become, can become quite detrimental. So you, we're in Pride Month, all these brands, you know, everything's changed into a rainbow. And then you ask these organisations, so how diverse are you as a business? And I can guarantee you, I would imagine less than half of the ones that have gone about changing their social Instagram posts over this month will actually know, will actually have any understanding Almost certainly their marketing team won't have a clue or their creative team won't have a clue. They're not asking for those stats and facts. And this is my first step for you all is to fucking ask the question. Ask the question, right? We want to do something around environment and decarbonization. Well, what's our carbon footprint? Like, give that sense first. Like, we want to do something that is 
um, focused on social equality. Well, how well are we doing in terms of attracting diverse talent into our business? How well have we performed in actually creating an environment which encourages socioeconomic mobility? Like, why are we doing this? What's the point of this? Are we jumping on a fucking bandwagon or is there an actual reason as to why we are putting together this idea, this creative concept, this moment in time where we can campaign for something? So know what you are activisming and then get your own shit in order first. You are the most wonderfully creative, talented, eloquent people in industry, in an organisation. It is your duty as a human being to first make sure that if you are, before you go ahead with some preachy campaign, that you actually use your creative talent and your communication genius to see whether you can change internally first and you can make improvements internally first. And here's the benefit of doing this as well. If you just go out with the forthright communications or the kind of the the public comms, the preachy comms to say, this is bad, this is what good should be, et cetera. And you have no evidence to suggest that you've gone through that pain and that change yourself, then that campaign will fall flat on its arse after a week, after two weeks, after a few weeks. What takes courage and commitments and creativity is to start with your own house first. And to get that in order first, because then you can provide learning, you can provide insight, you can provide teaching that actually genuinely feels put together, that generally feels whole and complete. And then you have a platform of real strength and identity to go live into the public world and say, this is what we did and this is how we can help you get there. So a big part of having, of operating as a conscious creative activist within your own organization is to first ask those tough questions and to second push that we make the change first so that we can show the workings out of that change to the wider world before we go with some big creative hoo-ha so what do i mean by laying out a sort of beautiful roadmap it's important to note right now that the likes of the asa for example are cracking down on people that are just going live with some weird and wonderful random target net zero by 2037 or some shit like that or um you know we are going to be a hundred percent um you know carbon free by by this moment in time or you know we're going to eradicate plastic and bring more water into the world by 2057 with fuck all credible action or activity to back this up so how do I think creatively we can change this? I think we can put a lot more creative energy into developing a roadmap of change and communicating the different milestones of that roadmap of change so that people understand what a step one, a step two, and a step three looks like, rather than jump straight to the end vision and say, this is where we're going. You know, want to come and join us? I think there is elegance and beauty in laying out a map of change for people to understand the trials and tribulations that you're going to go through, to understand the different steps and the mechanics that that uh, need to be created and need to be figured out on your path, on your journey to this particular goal. So, you know, in the in the context of an environmental sort of platform or making sure that you're going to be uh you're going to be reducing your carbon footprint it's all well and good to say you know we are by this point in time um going to be net zero although i think that's a complete bullshit statement anyways unless you're literally going around capturing uh, the farts of your employees and sequestering it under carbon um under granite sorry you're, you're you know you're not going to be a net zero organization the most net zero thing you can do is just not exist but Using that as the framework for this analogy, you know, if you're pointing this sort of thing over here that says we're going to be net zero by this time, I think a lot of creative talent is focused on making that end goal really, really sexy and intuitive and beautiful and delicious and dynamic. And fuck all time is spent in telling people how you're going to get there. And I want to see that reverse. And this is the reason why our geopolitical climate demands, has let us down. Right. It demands that we have to step up and provide those roadmaps. 
Why? Because we are looking at UN SDGs, for example, that have been created back in 2015, 17 of them that we created back in 2015, the vast majority of which have their targets set out to the end by 2030. And we are about <clears throat> and about 15 percent of those targets we are actually set to meet. So then we move on to step five. Be fearlessly transparent in the way that you communicate and the way that you talk about a campaign or an initiative. You know, it's, and I talk about fearless transparency on purpose, really, because you know, I think there's this, there's this idea that transparency holds risk. If you are transparent, it means that you are providing something that is risky, that you're giving off a sort of warts and all impression of yourself or your brand that people are going to poke holes at. But here's the thing. Transparency breeds fearlessness. It leads into fearlessness because people can't fucking criticize you if they haven't got the courage to step up to your level of transparency first. You may make mistakes. You will make mistakes. You will absolutely fuck up in your journey, both as an individual from a professional perspective and a personal perspective. If you're transparent about those mistakes, you become bulletproof because you're sharing with the world, this is what happened. This is what we've done. This is what we learned. This is what you shouldn't do during this uh, during a similar episode or a similar scenario. And the final bit in all of this, this step six in all of this, is don't wait until 2050 to fucking report on your progress. If you've put all of this effort into identifying what it is that you want to activism or be an activist around, I see so many organisations trip up because they forgot to tell anyone how they're doing. <clears throat> They've forgotten to bring about a sense of momentum or progress in, in their work, in their campaigns. And... You know, I urge you, if you are going live with, if you're creating something for the next World Environment Day, don't just let it li live and die on that day. You know, if it's something for pride, bear in mind for, that people are still gay, queer, they're still bi, trans after pride is over. So give that sense of momentum that you're going to work on something beyond a sort of date or for the love of God, don't just put your next form of communication in some obscure time in the future. This is how you can find me uh, on Twitter at Bound Bear. This is my agency is at Don't Cry Wolf. Or you can drop me a line or you can even book time in my diary at Don't Cry Wolf. Um, dot com if you want to rant, rave, disagree, challenge, agree, I don't know, whatever it might be. I'm very, very happy to speak with you all. Um, and thank you so much for letting me be a part and parcel of this and this uh, and this progress and this process. It's been unbelievable you're unbelievable chrissy and the team are extraordinary um and just realize that you have the absolute power um to make this change and it, it is within our grasp um thank you and i'll see you at work uh, we'll um, we'll pass on your um, your applause to him uh, but, yeah okay so look there's some interesting stuff that that, that john raised there he's always uh, brave and contentious, creatively brave, and it's good to hear. Um, and, and, he, and he nudged a couple of issues that are interesting, net zero, net gain, not zero, not gain. It's really easy to criticise, and it is fair to criticise. But we didn't have them 10 years ago, and, and I'll take that. I'll take the fact that they exist and, that, and they didn't before. And, and he also talked about, you know, don't stay silent till 2050. But, but the problem is we've, we've gone on this trajectory from doing nothing to greenwashing to, to basically keep me out of prison, Mark. That's what I was asked to do. Then, then keep me relevant, Mark, and then keep me out of the papers, Mark. We've gone on that journey, and then we're at green cocking. So a portmanteau of peacocking and greenwashing gives us green cocking. And now we're at green hushing. Oh, I didn't say anything. Someone will criticise me. Or I didn't say anything because I've done nothing. And we, need, we do need that radical transparency. That's exactly where we need to go. Okay, I think we... I am clicking, but lunch. Okay, so that's that one. That's that challenge we had earlier. Is that the same challenge? No, it's different. Well, then we're on lunch. Different challenge. Oh, okay, sorry. Talk to someone you've never met before. Did you all do that? Did you all do your challenge earlier? Yeah, I got asked by a couple of students, so I got challenged. No, I appreciate that. Uh, and now I want you to, to ask that, but to find somebody else and to ask them, how can I help? Is that all right? Yeah. Feeling brave? How can I help? <laughs> you can open the door when everyone leaves. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you so much. We'll be back in one hour, which I make it um, five to two. Enjoy your lunch. Have a chat. Have a wee. See you later.